Leadership development exists because none of us are perfect, fully realized people. We all have room for growth in our lives and we need help along the way. Hi, and welcome to Developing Imperfect Leaders. Because the last time I checked, we're not Jesus. This podcast is a project of the Leadership Development Institute at Hope Community Church, intended to help you explore and grow your leadership skills for service both inside and outside the church. I'm your host, Paul Stiver, and I'm joined by my co-hosts, Kaylin Larson and Natty Severson. She did, I think, attempt hi. to say hi there. What, what, what just <laughs> happened? I hope the camera catches that. Did you Holy get a frog God. in your throat? <laughs> 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 this is going to show that we do usually, not... We do not... Usually you give pause for us. <laughs> I thought pause. I gave a little pause. <laughs> I gave a pause. No. You like cut your own... Oh. <laughs> You cut your high off because you thought I... I you, thought you got a frog oh, in your throat. Like you just, <laughs> <laughs> That's what it is. Well, so he just yeah, kept audience, going like, cover, cover. I was, yeah, it the, was more because he said, and, and then I was like, oh, we're not could, doing a hello this you time. You could jump in no. and say words. It's allowed. But the, the audience will learn just how edited this show is not. Uh, and the fact that gosh, we're going to leave this that, all in. Uh, um, anyway, okay, wow. uh, let's get it. So there, so Kaylin is in the room, as is Natty, uh, and it just we're getting started. I think Natty probably, I'm guessing, has a would you rather. I do, I do, and us. we've been doing a lot of kind of tragic would you rather's, you know, a lot of the doom and gloom. So I thought I'd go with a more positive would you rather for this morning. So uh, would you rather have a personal driver that drives you everywhere you go? Like in like, like think like town car or something, you know, like it's nice. It's nice, mm -hmm. um, but not audacious. Uh, it, or a private chef who makes all your meals. Private well, driver or private chef. I And it's neither of us of cost to you. They come free of charge. Yeah. I'm got to go private chef. Private chef. Um, because that would eliminate a lot of time in my life from, although I do like to cook. I that would I'm assuming they would source ingredients is my guess. I'm not grocery shopping for what they're making. True, uh, I never thought of that. That is an advantage. I also like to drive, and I don't like to not drive. Mm. Some would call it a control idol. Others would call it a control <laughs> idol. But either way, it's a control idol that, and I like to drive, and I don't like to be a passenger. So I would choose a private chef, and I would hope. Sorry, I know there's a long answer here, but I would hope that. Having a private chef would help me eat healthier than a, my personal chef, who is me. My personal chef, who likes butter and, <laughs> and carbs. And, and, and Takis. Uh -huh. um. <laughs> I would also choose a personal chef. We recently were on an all-inclusive vacation, and Kurt reminded me how nice it was to, like, walk out of our room and choose any place we could go, and we didn't have to make any food. And so just... Like being reminded of that, I was like, "Oh, to not cook and then to not do my dishes." If the personal chef also did no, the dishes, that okay. is not included. I don't think oh, chefs a, yeah. do dishes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I I don't want to make this too mono, but uh, I would also pick the personal chef, and I think for Paul's reasons too, because I I me and Jared have been doing uh, one of those. You know, your your dinner comes in a box thing. I don't want to like name a brand. Get in trouble Unless, here. Once they sponsor us, then we then will. Then we'll start like like all the other podcasts. Order, yeah. blah, 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 commercial, commercial. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, so we've actually tried two. We're on our second service just to kind of compare and contrast. We did one for like three months. And so um, I'm enjoying it quite a bit. And Jared is really motivated to cook when there's like all the ingredients are there. And so he, I got to say, he cooks like three out of four times with these mm -hmm. in a box meals. So wow. Thanks, Jared. Uh, yeah, um, I'm going to be obsessed with this camera just staring right at me. <laughs> That's great. Um, so, yeah, so uh, we're excited about that. So personal chef, though I don't have a control idol of driving, I would prefer not to drive. Same. That's why to me it was like tantalizing because mm -hmm. you could also then do stuff. True. Like, That's very true. Well, you're my driving, thought was you like, email oh, or whatever. does the driver also drive the kids? Or oh, to like drop off? I think it's yeah. a personal... The, am I something? That'd be like a car service for the family. I guess yeah. that could have maybe, that could have maybe up the ante. Because that could have swayed my decision a uh, little Well, bit. let's see if I can bring this up later And would you rather. I think we probably need to get going. Yeah, we could possibly the consider content. the actual episode and not just uh, hypothetical scenarios that will never happen. <laughs> uh, so let's get into it. Today's episode is actually the 12th episode of season two 
Uh, and the leading question for this week is how can I break a shame narrative? And actually we, because it's how can I break a shame narrative, we have to do a definition of what a shame narrative mm. is. Again, mm-hmm. a, a kind of following up to our episode last week on shame. And so all the quotes from this week come from an article actually on our website, Hope CC Resources. Uh, and this was an article that Kaylin and I wrote. It was actually her idea to turn Shameless this fuck. topic into an article. And the article is called Breaking a Shame Narrative. And here's kind of what it is. A shame narrative is a story that you tell yourself internally that reinforces to you that you don't matter, you are bad, you do not have worth, your needs are not important, etc. So shame says I'm bad on an internalized kind of personal value level. An example of an internalized shame narrative is you, like this would be you talking to yourself. You can't wear that outfit in public. Everyone will think you look so fat, right? So that's you talking to yourself. That's not like no one said that or demonstrated that. You're kind of believing that. And obviously it impacts the way you think about your own value and worth. Uh, So this is something that a person is telling to themselves as a reinforcement of their self-perception that they don't matter, they're bad, they do not have worth, or they aren't important. So just to get into this a little bit, what are, or maybe we've thought a couple common shame narratives or what have been common shame narratives for you in your life? Oh, I didn't realize this is where we were going first. Um, All right. Did we skip past the leading question? This is part of the leading question. Oh, all right. It's Um, a question in the leading question. question If you want, I can answer it first. Yeah, go ahead. Because I... (laughs) Prepared. I... Uh, Am I in the wrong episode? Hang on. While you answer, let me duck down below this microphone. (laughs) Great. This is awesome. Uh, Keeping it profesh here on the pod. Uh, So, a common shame narrative for me has been... in a. It shows up sometimes in relationships. Um, is that your my needs don't matter as much as mm. someone else's. So I shouldn't assert my needs in a relationship because my needs are always secondary to someone else's needs. And so often then I won't, um, you know, kind of say like, oh, this is something I would need out of the relationship because I'll just assume that others need that. And their needs are more than mine. Their value, they they kind of matter more. That person matters more. I matter less. And obviously that'd be unhealthy for a relationship because in a relationship, both parties' needs matter on an equal level and there could be a conversation back and forth. So that'd be one. Um, Another example I had um, is why take a risk, you'll fail. Mm. Good things happen to others, not you. I Mm -hmm. think as I've come to faith in Christ, this one has become smaller, but I still feel it from time to time of, of, yeah, you shouldn't take a risk because it wouldn't work out for you that way. Um, and then another one is just, you aren't doing enough. Um, you aren't enough. I'd say that's a, my guess is that's a pretty general one for all of us, but, um, that's kind of broad, but that's one, another one I'd say of kind of that shame narrative. Again, they're hitting on value and worth and kind of going on a deeper level on what we believe about ourselves. Uh, for me, the first one that came to mind was um, you're not like meeting other people's expectations. So whether that is at work or in the home or in relationships, so then what I can do is like over commit or um, just stress out that I'm not doing enough. So yeah, then I do more, whether having to do more at work um, or just taking on more in order to show that, no, I am doing enough and I am worth it. that's probably my main one, if I'm honest. Yeah, I was trying to, <clears throat> excuse me. I was trying to uh, do this. I actually answered the leading question for, I was like, where are my notes? I actually answered the leading question of like, how do we break the shame narrative? But uh, I see we're now going to unfold that over the course of the entire <laughs> podcast. So I don't need to answer it right off the, right off the get Try to throw here. a wrinkle into the notes yeah. every time to keep you guys on your yeah. toes. All right. So yeah, recently the one that's really been on my mind is like, uh, the you're getting older, so your value is decreasing. Hmm. Wow. So, you know, became an empty nester, kids left, and suddenly my kid's getting married. You know, all these things are happening where they're really, they're really good things. I'm enjoying being an empty nester, <laughs> and I'm really glad my son's getting married. But we're experiencing these things, and you're like, they're indicators that you're aging. And then when your body's also telling you you're aging, hmm. you know, like hmm. your hair is thinning or, you know, like 
you, you like have wrinkles that are going to now be there forever. And and the things that society tells you aren't indicators of wisdom, but are are indicators of like a lack of worth. And so mm. really fighting that narrative of that. And I think combined with that is like the various issues my body has had with like knee injuries and, and different things. And, I, and that really is like the not being an athlete has mm. really been on my mind. Mm-hmm. Like I watch people do things. I watch younger people do things. And I'm like, oh, I used to be a, I, I used to be an athlete and I used to be a good athlete, right? And so who am I now is like the, is mm-hmm. like the question, mm-hmm. but I, I think mm-hmm. it's, it's, and it's not a bad question to ask because you do, things do change as you get older. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to be, you know, like, you know, like jumping all over the place in, in 30 years. I don't even jump now. I shouldn't jump. Um, I'm not a good jumper. Um, but like, but it, it, it affects my thoughts on myself and it tells me I I don't have value because I'm not those things and and so those are the narratives I think that recently have been spinning around in here so that's really good Uh, thank you guys for sharing those Um, and it is wild how this again to kind of highlight shame here and that these are things that are cutting deeper than like oh I'm not good at parallel parking or whatever you know what I mean like it's hitting a little (laughs) harder than like (laughs) It's just not a skill I have or like, a, like these are things that are kind of hitting us on a really a, an intimate kind of personal level that we're wrestling through, um, which gets us into the quote of the week as we think again about shame narratives. And it's a longer quote, so bear with me. It's from our article, but it I think gives us insight. So it says, we can know that we are listening to and internalizing a shame narrative when we are consistently beating ourselves up in our own mind. We might say things that demonstrate that we are really down on ourselves, that we don't matter, that we suck. Remember, shame says I'm bad at an internal personal value level. We can know that we are listening to and internalizing a shame narrative when we find ourselves unwilling to take care of our own needs or assert our desires in relationship. We can know that we are listening to and internalizing a shame narrative when we are in constant comparison to others or in consistent need of approval from others. We can know that we are listening to and internalizing a shame narrative when we are not taking care of ourselves, whether it's physically, mentally, spiritually, emotionally, because we are unwilling. Or maybe I would add even we don't think we deserve to be taken care of, so to speak. So what jumps out to you, kind of trying to hit it, like, how do we know this is impacting us? What jumps out to you guys about this quote? Yeah, I I numbered them. Um, And you guys did a great job on this, by the way. I really like this. I think it's helpful to have... Um, these shame indicators because I think we're so used to feeling shame mm-hmm. likely yeah. that we don't even realize we we don't acknowledge it as shame we wouldn't call it shame like things are gonna we're gonna have these thoughts probably all day long lurking in the back of our head and uh, that we don't realize our shame and as I've you know met with other people and talked to them about shame especially younger people and I and we talk about shame and we actually teach it in one of our classes called Ministry 101 we have a week about shame when we talk about it I think some of the people we talk to in the class just are like, no, I don't, I don't deal with shame. Mm-hmm. And then as we unpack it, they're like, oh, I deal with so much shame. I just didn't realize that's what that was. Mm-hmm. And so uh, I numbered them. So uh, I'm just going to reread them just for the listeners at home because um, in a numbered order, because I like numbers. It helps me to remember things when they're numbered. So number one indicator is asserting ourselves in relationship. Like we're not... We're not getting our own needs uh, met in a relationship. And I don't mean in a me monster sort of like way of like, oh, yeah, I need all my needs met. But when we're seeing that other people's needs are totally bulldozing our own. uh, The second one you said was a comparison trap, which I think, Mm -hmm. oh, yikes. And I'm like, as an American woman, I totally resonate with that. And I'm sure men do too, right, Justin? Mm -hmm. Um, different maybe ways to some extent, but probably not all too different, I guess, if I think about it. Uh, third, seeking approval from others. I think, yeah, we if we're trying to validate ourselves in the eyes of other people and it becomes a part of our identity, that's a, that's really a big flag that I can relate mm-hmm. with. And then fourth is, in general, not caring for ourselves um, physically, mentally, spiritually, and emotionally. So again, that I, th- I think it really just helped to narrow them. And I think it's so accurate. So well done, guys. Yeah, I think what I like about the quote is um, someone can resonate with all four of them or you might like 10 to one more than the other three or 10 to two more than the other three. 
or even like depending what the shame narrative is, you might like, I mean, it might just vary on how you're like responding to it. But I, like, I definitely relate to the comparison one. It's like, that is what is on repeat in my mind if I'm like walking through shame. Yeah. And it's probably showing up like, not just like, oh, they have a, you know, that house, I like that house, maybe even like it better than my house or whatever. It's probably like more, they have a nicer house than me because they're better than me and mm-hmm. I'm worse. You know, like it, again, it gets that personal Plays level. Into the value. Yeah. And I think if I wanted to highlight too, like, as we think about this, why talk about this uh, in the, in the church? Because, uh, and I think I love the, the book we read, Shame Interrupted by Ed Welch. He actually says, God hates shame. I think w- reasons why we might think about that is because God has made us in his image. And so he actually, by making us in his image, has declared that every single human being has, is worthy of dignity and, and va- has value to him. So actually, when we start saying, I don't have value, we're actually disagreeing with what God and his word mm-hmm. and his creating of us mm-hmm. is telling us. And so it is a significant thing to walk through. This isn't just like a, a modern therapeutic concept or anything. Like this goes down to what God has said about us and that we have value to him. Yeah, before we just move on, I want to also point out that another way I've observed shame in myself and in others is that instead of these that seem more like sort of that passive side of shame, there can be more a, a more an aggressive like overcompensation side. So if you're like, yeah, I totally take care of myself. Mm-hmm. I totally, you know, like, I totally assert my needs in relationship. Um, it it could also be that we are struggling with this. I'm putting on this bravado, yeah, mm-hmm. to yes. cover for the fact that you know I felt shame since I was a little kid. Maybe your parents parented with shame, mm-hmm. right? That's yeah. that's actually yeah. probably unbeknownst to a lot of loving parents. Whole right. other episode, unbeknownst to a lot of loving parents that they're parenting using shame, yeah, right, and so. Um, you know, when we've dealt with that or, or parents who are just overtly using shame, you know, just to behavior manage their kids, um, we might then put on a false bravado rather than a more traditionally low self-esteem. We might have an overinflated sense of self-esteem that really is just kind of like born out of a really big void of how we feel about ourselves or finding our worth and a lot of these other things. So yeah, that's a good addition. Yeah, that's really good. It actually made, reminded me too of what Kaylin was sharing about when she's feeling shame, she kind of goes into an over productivity as like a way to prove mm. self. Mm-hmm. So how often are we just running around scrambling mm-hmm. and kind of uh, almost like, no, this is just my life. And I'm, I kind of am overproductive because I, that's just kind of who I am and how I'm wired. Mm-hmm. When actually we're trying to like fill up that void of like what we're actually feeling emotionally behind the scenes and like, uh, and we look at that person, we say, oh, they're just highly productive, highly successful person. And it's like, oh, no. oh but maybe they're, <laughs> maybe they're actually <laughs> kind of running from confronting some of these realities and feelings. Yeah, that's for me. If I can just get somebody to like me or the target person to laugh at me, you know, mm-hmm. the target checkout person, if I can get them to like oh, laugh wow. with me, yeah. that's like a, and I enjoy making, you know, that, that would be a pretty routine job. Like you, so like I try to have a positive interaction with people, encourage them, make them laugh, which is not a bad thing, no, but I, it also yeah. feeds my, like, yeah, I can make anyone laugh. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm awesome. You know, like... <laughs> I hope that becomes a clip for it. Now that I know we're clipping these out and we're going to yeah. see myself like, ha, 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 I'm awesome. You know, like. <laughs> Just that clip. It would be a gif, actually. Yeah, it's going to be a gif. a gif. It's like Schmeagle. Um, you want to try your Schmeagle impression no, again? Oh my season God. one. Season one call Season back. one call back. I'm ready to cry laughing uh, again at that. Kaylin invented, in case you're a new listener, <laughs> Kaylin invented. Ma precious. Ma precious. <laughs> Southern Schmeagle. Southern, like. Southern Gollum. Southern, su- Southern Gollum. It was Ma <laughs> precious. <laughs> Can we get that audio clip oh, plugged in here during that? That takes me back. Probably not. Austin's like, nah, too much. Too and much. If work. you haven't listened to season one, now there's your incentive to go back and just find that clip because it was a one of a kind gem of a moment. Um, all right, last thing here, growing together. Let's kind of discuss now the practical side of identifying. We kind of talked about identifying, but how do we interrupt and kind of break a shame narrative? And so a few things here that we could talk through. I actually have a kind of an example, I think. Um, so one, identify, and this is from the article as well, identifying a shame narrative needs community. We actually need people sometimes to interrupt the way we're thinking about ourselves and say, oh no, that's not, that's not the reality. Like, for example, if you've ever, um, you get like a performance review and someone's like, I thought you've been really doing a great job on this thing. 
And you're like, oh my gosh, I've been thinking the whole time that I was doing a terrible job on this thing. Uh, so uh, we need community. Second one, uh, interrupt a shame narrative with the why ladder. I think we've talked about this before, but why ladder is just asking yourself the question why or asking someone else the question why kind of at least six times. Really try to get to the bottom of of the issue. Mm, mm-hmm. um, when we get to that point, we can kind of see, oh, here's what I'm believing. Like the, when we get to the bottom of the why ladder, that six question kind of shows you the real thing you're believing. So, uh, and then, and then um, the third thing is then you take that, what you've identified as your shame narrative and you apply the gospel. So even the example we gave of like, I don't believe I have value. Oh, well, Genesis 1, where God created you, says you have value. All right. Like, that's a, my, save that sound bite for you. All right. Um, sorry. Uh, you got to look at the camera when you all do right. it. So, all right. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, now, let's talk through an example um, and say, um, here's the example I had. You aren't enough and you aren't doing enough. So that's kind of the shame narrative that you're initially kind of believing or, or, and so let's, and so in community then, um, what would that look like in community for some people to come around you as they see you real, you are kind of living in the shame narrative of you're not enough. Do you know that you're living in it or are people No, about people are going to gonna kind of help uh, you see it. Oh, Cause I was going to go with the, Kaylin has really, I mean, Kaylin's really adopted this. I think reading the Ed Welch book was mm-hmm. pretty formative for Kaylin. And now I'm talking for you, even though you're sitting right next to me, um, because you're not enough. No, I'm kidding. You totally Ooh. are. No. Um, <laughs> different episode. Yeah, different episode. Conflict. No, and Kaylin is so good at this that I was thinking about the oh, reverse sure. in community yeah. that Kaylin's so good at it. She'll just come to my office and she's like, okay, we had this email interaction and she's like, I just, here's the, nar- here's the shame narrative I'm hearing. And she's just so good at putting it out there that it actually motivates me to like identify my own shame, narr- shame narratives. Sure. Um, but I'd be interested to hear how you, how you got there. How did you get to that place? Did you have people, I mean, can you even think back? Did you have people who are like, man, are you sure this is not what's actually happening on the inside? Like, how did you get to that point? I think it was through LDI. That I think reading Ed Welch and then doing renovation groups and probably meeting with Carol was really helpful for me of like identifying or like uh, helpful to like speak that out loud. Or and I would even say to um, Brene Brown's uh, The Gift of Imperfection Mm -hmm. uh, and Daring Greatly, all of her stuff is like really good about bringing that to light. Because, like, she has this whole um, talk that she did about the lie she was believing about her husband. And then she, like, created this whole story in her mind. And then she brought it to her husband, you know, 20 minutes later. And he was like, oh, no, I didn't mean to give you that look. It was, I had this in mind. And then she was like, I stressed about that for 20 minutes and it was like nothing. Mm -hmm. And I was Mm -hmm. like, oh, that is, I mean, just thinking about, like, bringing that to people, I think, has been helpful for me. Yeah, and I think when we use community, we think about, you know, manner and matter matter, mm-hmm. right? Um, have we done an episode on that? We haven't. We that have would not. be a good episode idea. Um, this is something we say around here that manner, meaning how we say something, and the matter, what we're talking about, matter. They both matter. They're both significant. And I, so we would say, like, if we if if God impresses upon us, or somebody we care about, and someone we're in their life, that maybe they're stuck in a shame narrative. How can we go to them with like a humble, honest heart and say like, yeah, I see this in you. Can you, can you help me to understand or to show curiosity Mm -hmm. to maybe not just like, you know, like whale them with Thor's hammer of truth, right? I'm just thinking Mm -hmm. of the spinning hammer, right? How do we, how do we go to them and ask some questions, show curiosity to help them dig a little bit and maybe get to that unearthing of Mm -hmm. this and, and not, even, even not need them to agree with us. Yeah, but to just put it out there and mm-hmm. and allow the Holy Spirit to do His work in them. Yeah, and again, if if you're the person, let's say I'm, you know, I'm sitting with someone, and I'm like, I don't know if is this are they listening to a shame narrative or not? We can listen for are they making value statements about themselves? So again, instead of saying I'm not good at parallel parking. Like I shouldn't even be allowed to have, a, or you know, like a car, or I don't know. It gets like more intense. A value statement instead of just like a skill based or like a guilt based thing, where it's like 
yeah, just I'm not good at that. But instead, like, no, I'm not good at that, and I don't deserve good mm-hmm. things. Like, oh, that's just as the listener when you're meeting with someone and talking with them, that you kind of hear that. Um, the second thing, kind of talking about the why ladder, what would be some, so if you're feeling like you're not enough, what would be maybe some good examples of why questions that we would ask that person or even ask ourselves? Maybe we should walk down one of ours. I'd be willing to guinea pig this live. We did not rehearse this. So with my narrative of, um, we've done this in class before and me and Paul have teach ministry 101 and we've done this in front of interns and it's so vulnerable at the end. I feel like all right, so let's go with the, because why not? Let's go with the, I don't have value because I'm aging. Hmm. Which, you know, we might, if you're if you're a younger listener, you're going to be like, I don't feel that. But you're someday, hopefully, God will allow you the privilege of aging. And you'll be able to do this like I am. So anyone want to start? Help, help me through it. I mean, just why don't you have value just because you're aging? Because I can't. I can't do all the things that I used to do. Like I can't, <clears throat> I can't run anymore. I'm not allowed to run because it's too hard on my hip and knee because <laughs> I have arthritis in my hip and no cartilage left in my knee. And so I, I can't, I've been told not to run. I can't, um, I can't, you know, like exercise the way I want to. I can't, uh, I get headaches more. Like my whole, my whole body's just breaking down. So. Why do why would uh, you know those things in particular contribute to how much you matter or your value? Yeah, and I think that that's where you start to get at the question I have already been thinking about is because I had placed so much of my identity in what my body could do physically. Mm-hmm. Like I could run, I could jump, I was good at sports. You know, like mm-hmm. even I played dodgeball with the college students the other day, and I was like, oh my gosh, nothing works the same, and I just look like this you know, decrepit old person trying to play with these 18-year-old kids. And, you know, I just felt like I, I, I had to, like, fight feelings of shame while I was playing mm-hmm. dodgeball with college students because I'm like, I would have crushed it. I would have been that, I'd have been that person. And now I'm just like... At, like, 18. Yeah, now yeah. I'm just getting wailed on by college kids. So, yeah. I'd say, why, uh, why would aging be valuable? Yeah. Oh, that's yeah, a good twist. that's a good twist. Yeah, a little sick of, oh, went positive because it yeah. went positive. Yeah, why is aging valuable? Because I have picked up wisdom. I am a much more Christ-like person than I was when I was, let's say, nineteen, because that's when I actually, you know, came to know Jesus. Definitely more Christ-like than I was when I was eighteen, but um, definitely more Christ-like. Uh, I have learned patience to some extent. Uh, you have experience. Experience, right? I've been a much kinder person, much more slow to judge people. Um, yeah, I think God has comforted me in my need for comfort, and that does allow me to comfort others. So if I if I keep chasing, and I, just for the sake of mm-hmm. time, if I keep chasing that why ladder backwards, why, 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 you kind of like try to keep bumping down there. And ultimately, I think it's going to sound Captain Obvious, and you probably already jumped on this if you've heard something like this before, but ultimately I'm not finding my value in, in God. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm my, my value is coming from what my body can do or how well my body responds to this or whether I can wake up without a headache or have to limp when I wake up. I don't know. (laughs) limp for like the first five steps when I wake up and probably some people are like first five steps man you're just a spring chicken but like (laughs) um it ultimately the why ladder if I get to the bottom of the why ladder it's I I'm not believing God's truth that I have value yeah no matter what my age is right it's like it'd be like saying a newborn has no value because they can't walk Sorry, your baby's not going to come out of there walking, just in case you... Uh, yeah, that's okay. Or, or, or I, don't, or like, I don't want the baby truths to that walk. Are, the truths yeah. that I would never believe about somebody else, maybe somebody had, um, had, had, you know, like different physical capabilities than me and couldn't walk. Would I say they don't have value? Absolutely not. I would say that's totally not true. They're image mm-hmm. bearers of God. But when it comes to me, I can't, I can't tell myself that true statement and, mm-hmm. and we'll get to true statements. So I'll stop with that right there. But I, I would never believe that truth about somebody else or like my parents who are obviously older than me as it goes with parents. I believe they have infinite value before right. God. Right. So. Yeah. And it, just to kind of close that out of, 
and bring in the gospel truth. So as we get to that, to kind of identify those underlying narratives, we start to bring in gospel truth, which you started to do. This is where we actually, I think it's really helpful to go to the cross in particular and say, uh, for example, with your value ultimately comes down to, in your mind, like how well you perform. And uh, you kind of mentioned more mm-hmm. physic from the physical side, because if we stop and step back, you're like, oh, actually God has changed me kind of on a mental side, a spiritual side, a wisdom side for the better, but you're still kind of targeting that that physical side. And, and here on the cross, we're seeing Jesus actually show you have infinite value to him. He's mm-hmm. willing to die for you, not only for your spiritual kind of life, but for you actually to have a resurrected physical body in him, uh, in the new creation. And it's just a wild way that we, whatever our shame narrative is, for me, that you aren't enough one, the gospel truth is, uh, is you aren't enough when it comes to saving yourself mm-hmm. or carrying mm-hmm. the weight of the world on your shoulders. And actually Jesus is enough and he has done that for you. And he's the only one that can handle all those burdens that you think are crippling and, and kind of hindering you. You can give those to him and he's big enough to handle it. So that's been a, it's always helpful to kind of find a way to round out what we've identified and bring Jesus into that in particular. Well, that wraps up our conversation for today, but we want to keep connecting with you. So thank you for listening to the podcast. And if you like what you heard, be sure to follow our show and leave a review. We love connecting with our listeners. So if you have questions, comments, or topic ideas, please email us LDI at HopeCC.com. LDI is a ministry of Hope Community Church based in Minneapolis, Minnesota. We seek to develop leaders in their biblical thinking, Christ-like character, and ministry skills for service both inside and outside the church. We do this through internships, classes, seminars, and retreats. If you're interested in learning more about our internships or other opportunities, visit ldi.hopecc.com or email ldi.hopecc.com. Have a great week.